Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's John Masson from the New Cities Foundation. I'm delighted to be here with uh, Jonathan Wetzel, director of the McKinsey Global Institute. Hello, Jonathan. And Connor Dougherty of the New York Times, uh, author of Golden Gates, Fighting for Housing in America, which was published at the beginning of this year. It's a absolutely important book on the issue we all care very much about which is housing uh i urge you all to 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 to, to do read it um jonathan uh at mckinsey uh has published fairly recently also a deep dive into the housing issue in los angeles um so what I would do is ask you both to sort of direct your conversation sort of in two ways. One is sort of identifying the issue. What is the matter with California, for God's sake? Housing is a huge problem here. Uh, I think as uh, was pointed out in the Kinsey study, uh, it, the, uh, the, the, the lack of housing costs uh, just the L.A. city uh, over 2% of GDP per annum. It's a huge amount, it's billions and billions of dollars. It's a huge issue, obviously, not only for uh, lower income groups, but it's uh, uh, it's put an, an enormous squeeze uh, on the middle class uh, here in Los Angeles throughout California. So what is the problem? You know, How do we address it? How do we define it? And then what I would love you guys to do is really focus on what some of the possible solutions are uh, and do that in just half an hour. So over to you, Connor, and over to you, Jonathan, and good luck. Okay. I, I think, um, well, the, the problem with housing, the problem with California is that housing costs too much and there's not enough of it. And there's particularly not enough of it for people who uh, aren't wealthy. That's the problem in a nutshell. There's a lot of different solutions to that and we'll talk about them. But uh, I think what my book tried to focus on uh, was let's talk about what we need to muster the will to get those solutions. There are so many people in my book that are trying to implement many of the things that me and Jonathan will talk about, but they face resistance uh, from their neighbors, from people uh, of all sorts of different socioeconomic levels. Uh, sometimes they're accused of destroying neighborhoods. Sometimes they're accused of uh, prof you know, promulgating gentrification. So even though we are going to talk about solutions right now, I think I want everyone to remember that knowing what the solution is and getting it implemented are very far from the same thing. And at some level, people are going to have to try to get involved, pay a little bit more attention to their local legislators. This sounds like really boring stuff, but if there's one message uh, for America and, and really California, it's that these little city councils uh, some large, some small, but they set housing policy by and large in this country. They determine a lot about where housing is built, how much, and at what cost. And if we're not paying attention to that, um, and we're just you know kind of always thinking about, oh, what can the president do for this problem that is inherently local, we're never going to get anywhere. So anyway, Jonathan, what do you think? Yeah. Well, After I, I do this bullet points, Give me some bullet points. <laughs> yeah, some bullet points. Well, look, first of all, Golden Gates is an awesome book. Um, it's uh, it's really, it's a nail on the head when it comes to thinking about, to, to understanding, you know, the political dialogue, but also just, you know, the, the dynamics of this conversation and, and how it's changing. But let's, you know, to deal with John's first question about like, what is the problem? So we're, we're all there. This is an affordability problem. Um, that uh, and it's a uh, it's at this point, it's a problem that affects half the households in California. Um, I should note that it's disproportionately centered on Southern California uh, because of the lower incomes in Los Angeles than in Northern California. But overall, you know, I think a couple of years ago when we did the California report, uh, we had a number of about 5.6 million households were rent burdened. Um, that's a, an astonishing number. <laughs> and, in, in, uh, and that's about half the households. And then in Los Angeles, it's about 2 million. And John stole my number because it is a annual number. The annual cost of that to the Southern California economy is about $40 billion a year, which is again, a staggering number. That's the, that's the, it's a conservative number too, because that's basically the construction that we're not doing 
plus the consumption that we are not having because we're transferring that in rent. You know, so those those that is a direct tax on the state of California. And at the I should note at the California level, at the state level, that number is one hundred and forty billion dollars. So this is a this is an affordability problem. This is an economic problem. And ultimately, of course, it's a human problem because the lack of affordable housing is, is highly correlated to just about every aspect of your life. You know, whether it's your health, uh, your stress levels, your environment, um, all these things are deeply affected by your inability to actually pay the rent um, or have to move to somewhere where you could and then incur additional costs on transport, which gets you to the same place. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, so that's that's kind of my view. That this is a squarely affordability related problem that we have to fix and uh, for California's own good and for all of our own good. So, so that's, th that's the first question. Yeah. There's another number in that report that many people may not know that you are the uh, the progenitor. I can see you laughing. Um, yeah. So that report was the report that came up with this figure that said, uh, California needs 3.5 million homes by 2025 mm -hmm. um, to uh, make a dent in its affordability uh, problem. It won't even get anywhere near that. Uh, and it seems increasingly likely, um, you know, that it not only won't get to that number, it won't even increase the pace of building from where it was when you published that report. In fact, it may decrease uh, significantly. Um, and that was even before coronavirus, uh, you know. Uh, so, all right. So, everyone who wants to blame somebody for the 3.5 million uh, homes figure that is thrown around in every California uh, discussion and was part of Governor Newsom's um, uh, housing plan, which he now has backed away from, uh, you, right? Uh, everyone can blame you, correct? Yes. So, um, but whether or not, well, leaving aside that number, how would you get to that number and what sorts of homes would be in that number? What would they look yeah. like? What well, would they call? Yeah. No, I, I think that, uh, first of all, you know, that number is just math. I mean, it's uh, California ranks 49 out of 50 in terms of housing per capita. That's what happens if you try to raise it. No, um, if, you know, at the end of the day, this is to the second question, you know, solutions, right? How do you get there? Uh, and uh, I think that you boil it down and you got to say there's basically three three related challenges: uh, unlocking the land, uh, lowering the cost of affordable housing, uh, and finding the money. <laughs> Those are the three things that we need in order to build more affordable housing. Uh, and I'm saying very specifically affordable, because if we look at, for example, the Los Angeles market and we compare, we'll see what's been going on. Actually, Los Angeles has been building. It's met its regional housing need assessments for the last uh, cycle uh, for overall, but almost 90% of that is for rich people's housing. Los Angeles does not have a problem building rich people's housing. So 120% AMI and above meets the target, overfulfills in fact. Um, what Los Angeles cannot build, and by extension the state, is affordable housing. So this is a very, again, really affordable issue. So why is that? Well, I mean, I think it was, you know, first of all, you got to have land. So what I've always looked at is like, where's the land? Do we run out? You know, is there so like a, you know, a shortage of land? And the answer is no, obviously we have plenty of land. And, uh, you know, there is all kinds of land. There's transit adjacent land. There's single family home zoned uh, land. There is uh, church land. There's public land. There's a there's retail and commercial land. There's lots and lots of land out there. It's just not used for housing. <laughs> so there's, you know, that's the first thing. The second thing is if you even get the land, then you got to be able to build on it in a way which you can make a project pencil. If you are saying, you know, I want to make the market work to build more affordable, well, you know, the project has to pencil. And the reality is that this is too expensive. Costs are too high. So you got to get the cost down. And I think there are two basic ways of doing this. Um, the real estate guys would would uh, would would uh, summarize this as being taller and smaller. So you've got to basically use density, which is the taller part. And uh, by using it, meaning like, okay, we'll get, let you build a bigger building, but you've got to use a, you've got to set aside a lot of that for affordable. So essentially, it's kind of a cross subsidy. So that's the taller part. And the smaller part is more of a shorthand for just saying, 
everything besides the traditional single family home unit or whatever we were using. So it's everything. It's co-living, it's micro units, it's prefab and modular, it's ADUs, it's bungalow courts, it's uh, do, you know single family homes converted to duplexes and quads. You know, it's everything you can do in order to innovate and reduce the cost, which also takes some policy. So that's kind of it. It's taller and smaller. That's how you that's how you lower the costs. And then finally you got to find the money. Um, because you know this is there's going to be a lot you want private capital that we can crowd in, but we got to make it worth. You've, you've got to you've got to make it economic for that to happen. So tax credits are a big deal here, and how we administer. Well, California has a couple billion dollars worth of low income housing tax credits that are allocated every year. So how well are we doing that process? We've found in the case of Los Angeles that you know, there's a lot you could do a lot better. Um, that uh, if you challenge people to meet a lower target in terms of costs, they can do it. They can innovate. So there's that. There's land value. Let's be a Georgist. Let's go there. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you know we can talk about the tax that that's possible there. And there are other things that we could we could look at. As I said, public land is a big topic. So finding you know those are three things. Sorry, I went on a well, long. I know as I talked about in my book, or at least tried to spend the book kind of talking or illustrating, is that. These are all great ideas. I'm sure you'd find, uh, you know, a lot of ideological diversity with your ideas. You know, yeah. um, any one of your, I, I can get to 90% approval of your whole platform and even the parts that, um, you, you know, and, and there are some parts that people disagree with, but they would still take, you know, a large part of what you just said, right? So here we have this, this list of solutions that a lot of people agree with, at least in part this package you just presented. Yeah. And yet when you try to put that package through the legislative process, or perhaps more importantly, when you actually try to build the housing, it doesn't happen. Here's a perfect example of that. Somebody a couple years ago tried to build uh, an affordable housing complex in Palo Alto. And what they were gonna do is they were going to also build some uh, expensive housing to cross subsidize the affordable housing. This was approved by the city council. It was subsequently that the, the, the uh, community nearby freaked out, um, started a referendum, which means they literally went door to door and hanging out in front of supermarkets, collecting signatures because they were just so, you know, using their own time because they were so unhappy about this affordable housing complex. Um, all sorts of different things were said, uh, you know, sometimes it was it's too dense, but other times people said, oh, they shouldn't be building those uh, luxury units because we need affordable unit, you know, oh, there should be more affordable. Every, every excuse you can come up with was thrown out. The developer sold, you know, retreated, sold the land and the city just a couple of weeks ago, uh, just approved a, a, a 16 home development where the cheapest home on the development is $5 million. So a, um, uh, you know, a, 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 the the process destroyed the affordable housing uh, using all sorts of um, completely bogus arguments. Again, literally at one point saying there's too much luxury housing here. And then those same people were oddly quiet when only luxury housing was built there. Um, and, and that's the reality. The reality is when you you take uh, all these solutions that you just kind of laid out and you try to try to not only get them to the legislature, but actually implement them, people will fight you uh, at every single level. Um, and so they're, it's kind of odd. You, 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 I've never seen a greater difference between what people say in polls and what they actually say uh, when, when the project is supposed to be built. I mean, in LA, for instance, um, you know, they passed this huge homeless housing bond, but getting that housing built, you know, the same voters who approved that bond by a, by a large degree, are against actually ever spending that money. It turns out it's, it's oh. hilarious because you say the attitude is like, "Well, I, I I passed the bond. You mean I actually have to build the housing too?" Yeah, exactly. Like, well, so what did you I think, think you were going to do? At it? some level, you know, people don't like talking about local politics. They either think it's below them, or it's too complicated, or it's hmm. um, you know, it's too. Uh, uh, difficult. It's you got to stay at these long late night meetings, but that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where this is really happening. I'm curious, 
I don't know. Have you thought about that solution? Have you th how do we actually get these things? Because you know, I can point to all sorts of instances of the solutions you're talking about being moved towards, and I can show you, um, you know, ever, fights that you know. Yeah. So. No, I mean, I I think the you're absolutely right, and this uh, the uh, Golden Gates really brings this out, and I love the I love the dynamic the stories around around this because it's it's so true. The um, uh, Look, it's. I would argue from an economics point of view, which is kind of what what I know is this is a tragedy of the commons kind of thing. It's like um, you know if you know there and these separate communities that are essentially saying no, nah, I don't want to quote unquote pay my fair share because of whatever you know you know in a I, in a theoretical world you could say okay you know that's all right, but then you don't get any public services. You don't get any transportation. By the way, we're going to tax you when you come into the rest of the of the state. <laughs> you know that that would be the appropriate response because they're basically saying, "Fine, I don't want to pay my share." It's like, "Okay, you got it," but then you don't get the benefit. That's a very theoretical argument. Let's go to the practical stuff. This is why I love the words "ministerial" and "by right," <laughs> as to say the only way of so getting those, the those words. Just to clarify for everyone, mean that instead of going through a city council to get a building approved, you can basically just go to the building department and as long as you conform with some codes that they have, they will give you a permit through a window. And it's a state driven thing by right, meaning that it came down and said, as long as the project looks like this, as in it's affordable, it fits this kind of, uh, this this uh, density um, is allowed and it's within whatever meter of uh, transit stop, you know, or whatever you're doing. I mean, but that's the definition. It's, it's uh, it, you can do this by right of it being like that. Um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, a, essentially a political statement. I mean, no, no two ways about it. This is the state of California telling you this is good. This is what the state believes you should be able to do independent and Right, overriding any particular objection you might have locally. Now, there's still a lot of ways to slow things down. Um, let's not, let's give people credit for being creative when it comes to blocking things. Um, but uh, you know that is absolutely the only thing that we've seen. Uh, now, it doesn't only have to be a state. I should note again, like things like Los Angeles is JJJ, which have been effective. Um, have were, were local and they created by right for transit oriented communities with, uh, you know, a fairly significant set aside uh, for affordable and it's it's delivered, I don't know, something like seven or 8,000 units now over the last uh, last two two or three years, which is seven or 8,000 units they wouldn't have had otherwise. And there are other things which have come down from the state like the ADUs saying every homeowner has the right to put in an ADU. You know, it's like, you know, wow, I didn't realize that capitalism required the state to tell me I have the right to do this. <laughs> but that's I what's happening. I always say, you know, it's funny, the ADU thing, um, I, I, you know, I'm as far from a libertarian as you can get, but or maybe not that, but I'm, you know, I would never identify it that way. But there is a little piece of me when people talk about fighting ADUs, I'm like, how much permission do you need to build a little shack in your own backyard? I mean, like, uh, I mean, not a shack, but, you know, a... Uh, it, it's the size of a shack, but it might have a toilet in it. But um, no, so I, 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 it sounds like just thinking about a solution for a moment politically, if I'm going to congeal what you just said, you're basically saying, which is, of course, something we've seen in this state, that you need to kick this to a higher level of government uh, or at least a level of government that is sufficiently large. The city of L.A. is pretty big um, that that it can make a hard decision that um that drowns out local opposition right i mean what i what i mean by that is and I, I wrote this quote in my book you know um james madison all the way back in the federalist papers wrote about the plans of oppression that uh come when you have too small of a democracy you know that if if too few people encompass the democracy they will all it will be a kind of a tyranny of the majority um and sometimes local politics, particularly suburban politics, seems like that, where they make decisions that make sense for this very small group of people, but it, but it, um, well, as you said, a tragedy of the commons, right? So yeah. it, it sounds to me like, though, what you're saying is we need to continue pushing uh, a high, this laws that are come down from a higher level of government. Is that pretty much what you're saying? Well, I would say that they're essentially, we need to deregulate housing. I mean, from the tyranny of the local 
socialist planning councils that have dictated exactly what could be built in any fashion and way, which have you know crept into every aspect of the. I'm sorry, I'm a bit, bit, bit inflammatory there, but uh, you know, I was it's, say, uh, if you come up, you know. Well, let's actually hold on. Let's center on that for a moment because I think that's important. Sometimes you and I have gotten to know each other a little bit. We had breakfast once, and uh, we've been on the phone several times. Sometimes I can't tell if you're a libertarian and sometimes I can't tell if you're a socialist without getting too deep into your political identity and, or, or, or using, you know, isms. I think that what you're saying, if we, you know, take out all the loaded political language, it sounds to me like what you're saying is this. Hmm. And tell me if, if I'm right here. We should have a plan. This plan should afford, it should, should have affordable housing. It should have subsidies. It have all these things that give us an equitable uh, society, um, higher inclusionary, which was something I'm surprised, uh, inclusionary zoning meaning requiring developers to have an even higher percentage of their um, yep. units set aside with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, sure. de deed restricted affordable, they cannot go higher on the rents. But that once we make that plan, we should give people a lot of flexibility to meet it. Meaning that, uh, you know, you say to a developer, you have to meet, meet X, Y, and Z, and that X, Y, and Z includes a pretty high affordable component and all these other things. But I'm going to get out of your way. If you if you reach these social and economic objectives that I've laid out for you, you know, with some and some does that, that you should be able to do. Yeah. You should not be able to build it if you can't meet those objectives, but you can have at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very much like that philosophy and that uh, we are trying to, first of all, recognize the externality, recognize what's going on. And we know that the lack of affordable housing is costing the state $140 billion a year. So there's a lot of money on the table that is not that for for the state and for the for the community if we can you know somehow create this affordable housing. So then you get to the point of okay, what's what's going on and why isn't it happening? And so we need to unlock the barriers. And the barriers are these local planning barriers. They're the abuse of the system. We don't even have to get into CEQA, but uh, you know how but the, about the process, how slow it is. You know, it takes. 36 months to uh, title a single family home development that's a single family home development that's got an environmental challenge. So you can imagine what it feels like for a multifamily developer. You know, so there's just abuse and process that, you know, if that's the kind of stuff that needs to go away. And if that takes the consensus of the state to agree on that, well, okay, you know, that's, that's, that's what it takes. And somehow we have to, you know, clear away a lot of the cobwebs that have otherwise gotten in because again, they're, uh, it, there is no other way of working together as a society. If we were all, you know, tiny little cities and there was no center, there was no common good, we would be a lot poorer. <laughs> so this is a, a big reality check. And that's why the transport thing comes in, because transport is a naturally a public good. Literally, it's the, how we bring people together. And so it's very natural, but because we know that transport creates tremendous value at the intersections when people come together, that's that's where they shop and that's where they want to work. And, you know, that's the then the question is, like, there's a natural saying, OK, well, creating all this value through a public good. Why aren't we using some of that for the public? You know, to you know, that's that's the natural idea around transit oriented communities. So you create, you know, affordable around that. So anyway, all of this is saying there's a logic to let's use the things that we have to that, that we we invest in as a community and let's let's create value by recognizing the value of those those things that we invest in as a community and then deploying that value against the things that we need and everybody has to do this everybody has to share so that's yeah, no, I, th I think that's one of the things I find so interesting about land. And one of the things I kind of talked about in the book is that it, uh, you know, it, 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 it does not hew to classic economics and probably never will. You can't make it. You can't move it. Uh, I mean, you can a little bit, uh, but not really. Um, and, uh, and, and on top of that, it, you know, we talk about the quote free market for land. And yet, as you just suggested, every developer is highly aware that they want to be next to a public investment of some kind. So that, you know, if it were truly a free market, everyone would be out building in, you know, all the, you know, patches of nothing that you see when you look at an airplane window. But of course, they're not there. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're where all the action is. Um, so one thing you said that I just want to kind of this is not really a solution, but I feel like it's worth uh, kind of noting in this mm -hmm. in the talk. 
you said um, you said if we didn't if we are all just this little islands of towns, we would be a lot poorer if we didn't have a center to go to and and interact with and share ideas in. Uh, and I, I think that's something that came up a lot with me, uh, which is that um, uh, people always ask me, like, where does your book live now that we're in coronavirus? And and I say to people, well, um, I could see a world in which we everything in the world falls apart and we all become the cast of The Walking Dead. Uh, and I was like, I see, can see a world in which everything goes back to normal, but I can't see a world um, in which we all live on the little farm somewhere and are and have any kind of standard of living similar to our current standard of living. That there is so much benefit from that if we don't recapture the city, if we don't get back to uh, some. I mean, I'm not saying we all have to shake hands and you know everything, but you know if we don't get back to having a a, a congregant economy, then it's just we're just structurally going to be a lot poorer. Do you agree with no, that? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would I would definitely go to town on this one and say, you know, the, the alternative is the dark ages. We tried that for about mm -hmm. 800 years. It really didn't work. <laughs> so, and uh, after we figured that out, we had the Renaissance <laughs> that was called Florence, you know? So, and yes, we also had bubonic plague and a few other things. So we wind up changing the cities to make them safer. So that's what we have here is we have a fail on the supply side of city health. And so, okay, fix it. You know, we, whatever you take, you know, whether it's touch, you know, contactless surfaces or, you know, track and trace, these things make your city safer. So I'm sure that we will change cities, but the idea that we can somehow develop and grow as a people in the absence of what we'll call, what I like to say, high density, high frequency interactions is a mirage that's unsupported by any aspect of 10,000 years of human history. So, you know, there is just like no alternative. <laughs> So while I'm just going to return for one second and then we can end on this. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, this is something I kind of asked you before, but I want to ask it more pointed. You you live in China. You're very familiar with uh, that kind of uh, one kind of system, uh, a more centralized system. And then you're, uh, you know, you live in LA and you're much more familiar with uh an American kind of federalist and, and in this case, hyper-local system. Um, focusing at least on America and California for a moment, yeah, uh, yeah. but, you know, taking that uh, context into consideration. What do you think, if you could, you know, what do you think is the ideal level of government to be solving this? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that we, we've clearly come to a consensus that, the hyper hyper local like suburban you know 300 suburbs deciding their own housing policy is is not good but i also think you know there is uh you know the president of the united states writing or you know having a cabinet that dictated local housing rules seems like it could be similarly bad uh you know assuming you know you could say okay this is the ideal place to start thinking about how to write and implement these rules, what would that level of government be? Um, and yeah. you can make up a fake level of government, you know, if-, if This if will you... get me in lots of trouble, I know, but uh, like I, well, I, I- I'm not saying you have to give the rules. I'm saying you, you well, you already done that though. Look, what is the level, what is the size and sphere yeah. of influence of the body that would be correct to do this? Well, I, I mean, I, I think it's a really great question. As I so, you know, we need a book on this one. Um, and jurisdictional issues are, you know, rife. This is a, you know, in many ways, the United States has a 19th, if not 18th century governmental structure, <laughs> hasn't involved that much. And uh, sometimes the boundaries look like that. So I would, to answer your question, first of all, California is the world's sixth largest economy. I think it's big enough to have its own housing policy, really. I think it does. So, <laughs> you know, and even that, you know, if you get down to Los Angeles, Los Angeles is the world's, I don't know, anywhere 20 to 25th largest economy. And so, yeah, I think actually the greater Los Angeles, SoCal area, you know, so frankly, the cogs are pretty good, most of them. I mean, they, some of them are pretty tiny, so you probably don't need that. But, the, you know, the centers of government, SCAG and, and uh, uh, ABAG. ABAG, 
but uh, yeah, and you know, these are these are for people who undoubtedly have no idea what we're talking about. These are associations of governments, and there's one for Northern California, one for Southern California, and another for San Diego, which is obviously in Southern California. But yeah, but because because there is a there is a NorCal and a SoCal, and we're in a state. I you know I think the state is the right level to have this debate. Um, and then, yeah, I think that it needs to be held in the context of, you know, California's long tradition of having a lot of independent cities. And so fine, I have no doubt that there will be a lot of debate one way or the other, and regardless at the local level. Um, but if we don't have this, this discussion at the state level, well, then the real question comes down, what good is the state? Yeah. So, no, it's funny. I mean, and maybe we should just end on this note, which is, I, I agree with what you're saying, which to kind of try to put a point on it, it's sort of like you're saying, um, we should have lots of debate, but that there should be a very clearly defined end to that debate. You know, that 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 local government should have all sorts of leeway to have a debate, but that there should be a trigger that says like, you know, this is where the debate, this is when and how the debate will end. So, uh, yeah. And to the to the what I see in the chat that that you know that's what the state is there for. The state is ultimately what is going to, you know, be able to intermediate and balance. And that's what politics is: is to weigh the competing interests, but recognize you know what's going to make the diff what's going to be the greater good here, um, in, in in a good government. So that's that's the that is the role of the state. So, mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I think we are out of time. I don't know, John. Do you want to jump in and tell us if we're out of time or? Uh... No, that's where I appear, gentlemen. Oh, sorry. So I just materialize. Okay. Hello, <laughs> gentlemen. Thank you for the incredibly pleasurable inside baseball of that conversation. I love Connor having to interrupt periodically to explain the streams of acronyms for SCAG and others. Um, the one the one point I would add as, as a listener I thought was interesting is, um, I, you know, it's fascinating how in particularly Northern California, the housing crisis has gone from, you know, cities like Palo Alto explicitly not even wanting to add jobs because it would further exacerbate their housing crisis to now the tech valley giants like facebook and twitter and others basically telling their employees like please move somewhere else we don't want to pay you salaries that will allow you to actually afford homes here so watching them do geographic arbitrage is the next step after. i'm not sure i fully sign on to that by the way uh i mean they these companies well so two things about that these companies have been moving jobs away for as long as there have been these companies. Intel started moving stuff to Arizona and Oregon in like the 70s, right? So this idea that you move jobs that are usually not core jobs to a lower cost center is, you know, you can go to a office building I just went to in Scottsdale uh, right before uh, coronavirus. That was like my last trip. And there are, uh, you know, you can see Yelp next to Zillow next to, right? So there there, there are, I wouldn't quite call them back office, but they're sales functions. They are, right? Okay, that's the first thing. So that's been happening for a long time, right? The second thing is, anytime you look at where these companies are moving jobs, where are they moving them to? Oh, Facebook's biggest office outside of Palo Alto is where? Seattle. Last I checked, Seattle has a pretty bad housing problem. Um, Amazon puts everybody through this ridiculous HQ2 charade then after getting, you know, Youngstown, Ohio and whatever to prostrate themselves for this, you know, fake contest. Sorry, I'm editorializing a little bit. They pick New York and Washington. Then they tell New York, we're not going to go there because they won't give them the subsidies. Open up an office with 1500 people anyway, and then quietly go by the Lord and Taylor building. So it seems to me that there is, and, and really this comes down to a philosophical question, which is, do you believe the cities make the companies or the companies make the cities? Me and Jonathan are both very clearly on the, the cities make the companies side. And I just don't, even if they're going to engage in geographical arbitrage, they're going to end up in these places uh, that have a very similar characteristics to the Bay Area and California. I mean, Google, go go look at Google's campus in Boulder, Colorado. It's not huge, but it's huge for Boulder. And they've had all, I mean, it, it just go read the Boulder newspaper fights about that campus. It does not read as anything different that is happening in here. So I mean, I would say, and Boulder as a whole, we get, next next year this time we'll do a what's the matter with Colorado session. I think Boulder is the only city that ever well, actually floated, some, but, but no, but Boulder actually floated doing a just blanket growth cap. No, we're, we're, we're closed. We're full now, I think, at one point. Apparently in the 70s, I don't think Boulder it's a that. that uh, I mean, this is a whole other topic. I remember Ed Glazer once telling me that he thought that there was something unique about college towns because they have a lot of like educated but 
people who know how to kind of like tinker with the cogs of government at a local level because they're like good at reading fine print and stuff. But, you know, Boulder and Palo Alto do share characteristics, which they're, they're, you know, lovely college towns that have become centers of economic growth and are almost like um, not sure how they feel about it. But um, I think there, there actually are huge similar characteristics between those places. Um, and if we're going to have a knowledge economy, we're going to inevitably have people clustering around these kinds of centers of uh, education and innovation and figuring out how to open those centers up and making them see, you know, that the, that the, that having a college, having a research university, such as a college, I mean, a giant research institution in your town, you know, when the state goes and does that, when the federal government goes and sends research grants to these, to these uh, colleges, they do so with the sole and not sole, but the like primary intent of, creating economic growth through the furthering of knowledge. And so you have like two levels of government being like, this is the whole point of this, giving money to this research university is to create jobs and growth and new ideas and new companies. And then of course the, the city that's actually hoovering up all this money is like, oh, that's actually like not what we want, right? So I think there's a kind of disconnect there about what the whole point of even having a research university is. Well, I came to cap this conversation and not continue it, but now I feel yeah. like oh, Jonathan actually, like not necessarily a rebuttal, but please, if you have a, a thought to add on this, Jonathan, I feel obliged. Well, now. I mean, I was just looking through the chat and I, I kind of wanted to add one thing. I mean, first of all, I, I think that the uh, employer assisted to this one, uh, employer assisted housing is a thing, you know, and uh, the reality is that there's one state in the nation, Illinois, which has even got a program to do this. And so this is a massive question of like, why isn't the state incentivizing creating more of a credit for employers to provide workforce housing? You know, I just think that this is such an obvious thing because it, you know, it would keep people, it would keep jobs in the country, in, in the state, and it would, uh, it would incentivize housing. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a strategy around that also related to, you know, where, and so, yeah, maybe not in Palo Alto. Okay, fine. So, you know, let's go to Contra Costa. Let's go, let's go, let's go to, Fre you know, Fresno. I mean, what, you know, that might also get linked to a, a transport infrastructure strategy, a train, who knows? <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there, there are ways of, there, I mean, so this, California has got to get back in the business of building communities, which is not a, you know, we can't separate housing from the job, from the infrastructure. It's the whole thing. And you've got to do it together. Back in the day, you know, L.A. grew in the San Fernando Valley. You know, everybody who's seen Chinatown knows that. Right. <laughs> so, you know, and you can argue, but that's that was how we created it. We created everything at the same time. And, I'm and so yeah, I'm obligated to note as a uh, proud uh, native son of Northern California that you also did it by building a 400 mile river from uh, our neck of the woods. So there anyway. was that there was that the, there was the water infrastructure. But the thing I wanted to get to the. Um, you know, in the ch uh, chat is that there is, and this is one thing we'd like to point out is that the private crowding in private capital is a big opportunity. So often we think we confuse big A affordable with little a affordable <laughs> in a sense, like big A affordable means the state does it all. You know, it provides the land, it builds the building, it, it funds the process. It does it, you know, it, it, it builds everything around it. I mean, yeah, you could do that. And it, what we get then is $600,000 a unit, you know, when market rate is closer to three. And so, you know, there, there is really an, you know, a rationale for saying, what could you do to get the private sector to do this? Because they're, likely going to do it perhaps a little cheaper, but definitely more efficiently get you the same perform. We talked a bit about that. So that's kind of the thrust of a lot of this to say, if you set the goals and if you set the targets and then you tell people build to that number and I'll give you the incentive to do so by dense, allowing for density, for example, um, or a parking reduction because the people in that building are not going to be using the cars. Um, so, uh, you know, then you can probably get a much better outcome than and much more bang for your policy buck uh, than you would otherwise. And I think that's the big thing that that hasn't really come to the table that, as much as it could be. So that's all right. Well, well, thank you, Joe. I will say we can keep going, I suppose. I, I don't know if there's out there demand. If you'd like to go, I mean, we were eating a little bit into some of our viewers' time, but I'm happy to give you another five or six minutes. If Connor, if you'd like to continue with that. 
Um, well, the participants is at 52. Um, I guess if they- if They're they, trailing if they, away to eat, but you know, they're still here, so. Yes, if it drops to 20 in like three seconds. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 my book is ultimately about looking at why this is so hard from a political level. And, you know, here are people trying to implement these solutions, uh, at various, you know, sometimes it's tenant uh, protection, sometimes it's building more housing, sometimes it's trying to build housing in a suburb, sometimes it's creating community land trusts, and it's really hard at every level. And so I think that we have to, uh, at some point, confront that it's not coming up with the solutions, it's finding the will. And one of the things I, I think is, I don't know if inspiring or whatever, but one of the things that makes me there's a chicken and egg thing here is this like, once you do these things, people just kind of learn to live with them. It's, it's, the, it's the building of something. It's the potential for something to come and every bad thing to happen that gets people really up in arms. Once it's there, they're usually okay with it. You know, uh, I, I grew up in a Victorian house in San Francisco and next to it is like a kind of not super nice 1960s apartment building that towers over it, blocks out our view of the bay and uh, or it doesn't block it out, but it obscures it and uh, has like a wall of windows on our backyard. I kind of knew the kids who lived in the those windows and always saw that house, th that building. That, I didn't think of that as some horrific monstrosity. I thought of it as just our neighbor, right? If you tried to build that building today, it would be like, all i mean people would flip you know and so i think that the, the 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 political difficulty about this thing is that it's hard to show people that it's like gonna be fine it's like okay you know if they build something kind of big near you or there's more people in california it's like it's gonna be fine it's you know but and and that and that that's where the difficulty comes in it's that when you talk about the solutions we're talking about all you hear are you know apocalyptic tales uh and um I, I guess the only thing i can tell people is that those are the same apocalyptic tales that people told before you got here right you know uh so uh remember that yeah no, i agree and i we didn't um get into it but connor you you and i talked about this but at the beginning about you know migration trends and you know what's going on with the state and the missing middle or the uh that that is the challenge because you know we are only keeping population well which is very highly correlated to employment and growth going because of uh low income in, in migration largely international and what we're getting is out migration from people who are, you know, just trying to climb into the lower middle class. And they're saying, gee, I can't do it here. You know, I'm off to wherever it's, uh, you know, Nevada, Arizona, and Texas. So that's, you know, that this is about for saving our state. I mean, it really is. It's about saving the future for our state so we don't become, you know, the missing middle. That's uh, that's the, that, I mean, I think there's a really a, a, a strong sort of economic integrated theory of why we need to do this and why by right and ministerial makes sense. So. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, gentlemen, I said the only points I'll add to that, Jonathan, is I think two of our other speakers uh, this week, uh, Issy Romum and Elizabeth Kneebone at Berkeley Turner, uh, published a paper where I think the average household income of out migration out of Northern California was something like $85,000. And the ones who are replacing them have even higher household income. So you know, sort of I mean, whatever hyper gentrification. I think the uh, the onion referred to as like aristocratization of, of places is happening there. Um, well, well, thank thank you both so much. I enjoyed this conversation so much. I got sucked into it. I, I'm I'm uh, I, we'll have to cap it now for our guest's sake. But I do want to point out that some of the conversation threads you had are going to continue. We're going to have a, a session um, on tomorrow on you know is the future. Or I forget which day now they are blowing together. But a session on is the I think it's Thursday is the future of the suburbs urban. You know, these cities like, you know, Palo Alto and others in these college towns, you know, are they realizing unhappily that their future is destined to be much more urbanized than perhaps some of their original residents wanted? Um, so that's gonna pop up. And then, yeah, and then uh, immediately following this, you know, go back to some of the, the capital A affordability argument. Um, there is, you know, um, and going back to uh, Eugene Jones this morning in our first panel, um, talking about, you know, and Jacqueline Wagner about whether we need more public housing in America. Which, which Eugene warned, but yes, but only if we 
you know, only if we don't underinvest it at this time. This yeah. is my cue for uh, for viewers here to watch the you know tomorrow night's film club. We're gonna have a discussion about the Pruitt Igo myth, which is the 2011 documentary about what happens when you build public housing and then systematically underinvest in it and effectively punish the residents who are there. So yeah. we'll have that conversation. We, we, repe it, we repealed Faircloth. We repealed Faircloth. That was a win. Uh, and so now we have to follow through. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to have that conversation. And there's a session on, on fair cloth and, uh, and public housing tomorrow, of course. So with that, I want to thank, thank both of our gentlemen here um, for, for this conversation. Um, we're going to encourage all of you to go watch uh, you know, the Food Ivo myth if you need more time in front of screens this afternoon or go off, uh, catch up with the rest of your lives, and then uh, return tonight on a Zoom link with Kate, Kate Wagner, McMansion Hell, who is going to uh, take us into our after hours activity of uh, dragging some of the world's more unfortunate buildings. So uh, I hope to see you all back at 5.30 for that. So uh, a round of virtual applause for Jonathan and Connor. Thank you both gentlemen. This is one of the liveliest chats we've had on here. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the deep wonkery of this. So um, thank you both so much. And um, yeah, we'll see you all back soon. Cool, Thanks, thank guys. you. Bye. Pleasure.